Hello, new or potential new Darktable user. Welcome to the dark side. My name is Bruce Williams. Welcome to the channel. I've been doing this channel since 2018 and I've been using Darktable since 2016. And what I want to do in this particular video is give a newbie's guide to Darktable 3.8 and in particular, the light table view, the importing and the preferences. Let's go. Hi and welcome to episode 105 of Understanding Darktable. There's a high probability that you are coming to Darktable from Adobe Lightroom. You're probably sick of the monthly fees or the fact that those fees change every time you turn your back. That's okay, welcome. You will enjoy Darktable once you wrap your head around it. If you've had a look at it and been intimidated, that is to be expected. It is a slightly intimidating interface in some ways. But structurally, it's laid out in a very similar fashion to Lightroom. Very quickly, I want to address the preferences, which you will find through this little cog icon in the top right corner of the central part of the user interface. And you will notice that everything is segregated into reasonably logical headings. Something you'll also find in the preferences is that whenever you change a preference away from its default value, it will end up with this little white dot. That simply tells you that is something that you've changed from its default value. I love that and I wish every other software developer in the world did that. It's brilliant because somewhere down the track, you're going to change something. And then a day or two later, you're going to notice, hang on, why is this not working the way it used to work? Why is it behaving differently now to what it was doing last week? And those little white dots will help you to hone in on what you might have changed. I love it. I really do wish every other piece of software offered that. I'm not going to run through all of the various things that you can look at in preferences because a lot of it isn't relevant to you right now. You'll get there as you spend more time with Darktable. Okay, so in terms of the interface, on the left-hand side, we've got import, collections, recently used collections, and image information. Over on the right-hand side, select, selected images, history, stack styles, metadata, yada, yada, yada. In the middle, we have our view of our images, and there are five different views. We've got the file manager view, the zoomable light table layout, culling mode, culling mode in dynamic mode, and full screen preview, which as you can see, you can access with the keyboard shortcut F, which I tend to do. I never use these buttons. I just use the keyboard shortcuts. All right, so let's talk about importing some images. If you've shot some images on a memory card, you're more than likely going to take that memory card out of your camera put it in a USB card reader or into a built-in card reader on your desktop or laptop machine, and you'll want to import those images into Darktable. You don't want to use Add to Library because Add to Library assumes that the images are already in the folder where you want to view them from all of the time. So in the case of a memory card, that memory card's not always going to be attached to your computer. So you would choose copy and import. If you've already copied the images from the memory card onto your local hard drive and you're happy with where they are, then you would use add to library because you're saying, I've already got them on my hard drive, just point to this folder. Okay, so I've been out in the garden this morning, shot a bunch of images just for the purposes of this video. So I will use copy and import. In the top left hand corner, you will see a bunch of places. These places will probably have different names depending on what operating system you're on. I'm on Linux. In this particular instance, 32 gig volume refers to the memory card that I've mounted through a USB card reader. Inside that volume, there are folders. There is the root folder of the disk, and then within that, there is a DCIM folder, which is where my Sony A7 III stores still images, and within that, a folder 100MSDCF. And here are all of the images on this particular memory card. By default, when you invoke this 
dialog box, the copy and import box, all of the images will be selected and that's why they are light gray. If you just wanted to select a handful, you could click on one and shift click the last one to select just those images. Or if you want a non-contiguous selection, you would hold down the control key and then you can click the images that you want to import. You'll notice that you can choose to sort by name or by the modified time and date. And over on the right hand side, we've got a column for show and hide thumbnails. So you can actually see all of the images before you import them. You'll also notice there is the option to ignore JPEG images. So if you shoot RAW plus JPEG in camera, but you don't want to keep the JPEGs, or you have no interest in importing the JPEG images, you can check that box. Recursive directory simply means if within my DCIM folder, or in this case, within the 100M SDCF folder, if I had subfolders that I had manually created whilst I was out shooting, recursive directory simply says, don't just look in this folder, look in any subfolders that exist within this folder as well. Next, base directory naming pattern. This is simply the root folder on your hard drive where you want to store your images. So you might have a folder called photos. I do, but I have subfolders within that. So if I click on the little browse button here, we can see that within my photos folder, I have a whole bunch of different folders. I'm going to put these in my test shots folder because these images are not images I'm going to keep. I'm probably going to delete them after I finished shooting these two videos. Then a subdirectory naming pattern. So that's basically saying, here's the root folder I want you to copy the photos to, but I then want you to create a folder substructure under there. And I want you to use some combination of either plain text and or wildcards, which is what I've used here. And as you can see, I have XF year forward slash, so that means new folder. So there will be a parent folder for the year. And then within that, year hyphen month hyphen day to create a subfolder inside the year folder that is named year hyphen month hyphen day. Okay, so in this instance, I want to see the images I shot this morning. So that is the 24th of January. And I'll just scroll down here till I find the last one. Hold shift, select those. Those are the images that I want to import into my test shots folder, into a year folder, and then into a folder named year month day. I can choose to keep the window open, which I don't need to do. Keep original file name. I personally never rename my images. You may like to do so. Again, you can uncheck that and you can use any combination of clear text and or wildcards to create a file naming pattern. So you might want to rename all of the images, dad's birthday party, hyphen, original file name to keep the camera generated file name on the tail end. It's up to you. You will soon realize that there is no end of ways you can manage your images in Darktable. Like I said, I'm quite happy to keep the original file name. By the way, all these wildcards that I keep on talking about, they are listed in the Darktable manual at darktable.org. I will try and remember to put a link to that in the description down below. Once we are happy with all of that, we can click on copy and import and we will see down the bottom here. Wow, that was fast. Okay, I hope you glimpsed very momentarily down the bottom it said importing one of 24 images. Uh, those images are now imported, but they have not been displayed by default. What you can do is go to the collections module and collections allows you to create collections of images based on any combination of criteria. By default, it will be film roll. I'm just gonna go with date taken, 2022. I can expand that. There is a month folder. And then the images I shot this morning, the 24th, just so happens that there are 24 of them. Uh, the first number is the date. 
The second number is the number of images in that folder. So if I go back four days to the 20th, I shot two images. Again, just mucking around. This is my test shots folder. So all of these images are just rubbish. Don't worry about them. Okay, so these are the images I shot this morning. If I wanted to now sort through my images and decide which ones I'm going to work on, what I would do is click on the first one, press F to enter a full screen preview. Now I can add a star rating with the one to five keys above your QWERTY keys, or I can add color labels with the first five function buttons. So F1 to F5. What I tend to do is use star ratings and I will give anything that I think is worth working on a one just to begin with and anything I want to discard, I will type R for reject. So this one I'll go as a one. That's a reject because it's out of focus. Out of focus, out of focus. I was using a manual focus lens here, people, so cut me some slack, okay? That one's not too bad. We'll go with that a one. Actually, no, we're going to make that a reject because the next one's better. It's slightly better exposed. That's a reject, reject, reject. Yeah, yeah, reject that one and we'll keep that one. And a whole bunch of these are rejects. Yeah, reject, 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 reject. Yeah, that one's okay. And reject and reject and yeah we'll keep that and yeah we'll keep that okay so that's the end of my images i can press f to come back into my file manager view and now we can see that the images that i rejected have all been dulled in the file manager view if this was a big shoot like let's say you've just shot a wedding and you got a couple of thousand images what you could do to collect all of the rejects would be come up here to the sort by drop down and choose rating and all of the rejects will be clumped at the end of the collection of images. Now if it is a really big shoot that might not be viewable on the screen so you could just hit the end key to jump to the end of your collection of images or you could click this little arrow icon to reverse the sort order and now all of the rejects are at the top. I would select the first one, shift click on the last one, and then in the selected images module, you'll notice that there is remove and delete or trash. So remove will simply remove the images from the Darktable database, delete or trash will actually remove them from your hard drive. I will click on delete it says, are you absolutely sure? Yes, I am absolutely sure. So now there are six images that I've kept. And as we can see, that folder has now reflected that there are only six images in the folder. Let's just quickly jump over to my file manager. And you can see that in the test shots folder, there is now a 2022 folder. And within that, there is a 2022 01 24 folder, which now has six images. Now, this is the first of the things that I want to draw to your attention. By default, or at least the last time I used Adobe Lightroom, which was admittedly six years ago, Lightroom did not, I'm, I'm talking about Adobe Lightroom here, did not store all of the information pertaining to the edits you've made on your images in XMP sidecar files, it actually wrote everything to an LR cat file, a catalog. What I very quickly came to realize with Lightroom was that's not a great way of working because if anything happens to that LR cat file, if it gets corrupted, you're toast. You've lost everything you ever did to every image you worked on in Lightroom. What I love about Darktable is that alongside every raw file and JPEG file for that matter, and TIFF file and PNG, whatever images you import into Darktable, you will end up with a file with a similar name with .xmp appended to it. Now, this is one of those things that new users to Darktable quite often get frustrated by. They go, oh, why are all these crap files all over my file system? Please, I'm begging you you will get used to these and love them because if anything was to ever happen to Darktable, 
If it crashed, and I've got to say, I've very rarely seen Darktable crash in my experience, but if it does crash, all you are going to lose is the edits of the image you were working on at the time it crashed because all of the information is stored in the XMP file that relates to that particular image file. I think it's beautiful. And you can open these XMPs in a text file. I'm not going to do it. It's beside the point right now. But I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Get to love those XMP files because they will save your bacon. And get into a habit of backing them up because even if you wanted to move images to another computer and you wanted to put a clean install of Darktable on that computer, you could take the image files and the XMP files and put them on the new computer and fire up that new install of Darktable and go import and add to library, point to the folder where they live, and boom, not only do the images come in, but all the edits come with them because the edits are stored in the XMP files. It's awesome. I love it. So we are back to the six images that we decided to keep that we might work on. Over here on the right hand side, we have the select module. Here you can select all, select none. You might choose three files and you can go invert selection. So sometimes it might be easier to select the images you don't want and then invert the selection to actually get the images that you did want. So, you know, if this was a hundred images, you might say, well, those are the two I don't want, but these are the 98 that I do want. Select the film roll. We won't go into that right now. Select untouched. will simply select images that you have not yet edited in the darkroom view. Okay, selected images. This will allow you to, as we saw before, remove or delete. It'll allow you to move them. So if you want to move them to a new folder on your file system, do it from here. Don't do it in your file manager because if you do it in the systems file manager, like you know, Windows Explorer or uh, Finder on the Mac, Darktable won't know that those files were moved and you'll end up with some skulls in your Lighttable view, which basically says, I'm supposed to know about these images, but I can't find them. You can also create physical copies, so actually copy the images to another folder. You can create an HDR if you've shot a bracketed set for HDR, and there's a whole bunch of other things here. You can rotate images, so if the orientation has not been read correctly, if they're displaying as horizontal but you know, or landscape, but you actually wanted them to be portrait, you can rotate them here. Copy locally, we're not going to cover. Resync local copy, we're not going to cover. I covered that well, way back early in this video series. Group and ungroup. So if you want to create a group of images, you can select the images that you want to be grouped together and click on group. The history stack. This will allow you to do selective copying and pasting of things you've done in the darkroom view. So if you want to take some developed settings from one image and apply them to a bunch of other settings for a consistent look, you would do that via the history stack. You will notice that there is an append or overwrite mode. Be very careful with that. It defaults to append for a very good reason. If you are doing a selective copy of the history states from an image, then you don't want to go into overwrite mode because it will discard every other history state that existed in the destination image. So be very careful with that. I've covered that in greater detail in another video. Styles, once again, allows you to take selected history states from a developed image and save those history states as a style. Again, because you might want to use that look you know, somewhere down the track in other shoots, in other s series of images, whatever. I have an Instagram frame, which basically creates a white one-to-one -one square with a black border around the image. So I can select this image and go apply, and that will apply that frame to my image. So now I can post that to Instagram and it'll have this white square with this black you know, thin black border around the image. And all of my images on Instagram have that look. That's just me. That's just what I like. If I wanted to get rid of that, I would have to go back into the darkroom view 
and remove that from the history. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. We want to stay in the light table for now. Dark rooms are the next vi next video. All right, the metadata editor that will allow you to apply some metadata to either one image or to a bunch of images as you see fit. The tagging module will allow you to add keywords to, again, one image or a series of images. You can use a hierarchical system for your keywords if you choose. I personally do and I love it. And you can choose a hierarchical view by clicking on this little icon in the bottom right hand corner of the tagging module. And as you can see, anything that has nested keywords will have this little arrow beside it. So you can see that uh, there are nested keywords underneath ARN. There is SBP 2011 and under that there is Trivia Night. To do that, to create a nested keyword, you would type in, let's say, parent for the parent keyword, then the pipe symbol. That is shift and backslash on your keyboard. That creates the pipe. And then you would go child one and pipe child two. And then you would click on new. And that will create an entire nested hierarchy of those three keywords where the top level is called parent. Then underneath it will be child one and below that will be child two. And you can have any number of nested keywords within any other keyword. If I was to go down to Australia, you would find I have nested all of the locations at which I've shot. So, yeah, yeah, you, you, you get the idea. All right, so that is the tagging. Then there is the geotagging module. This is really handy if you do a shoot with multiple cameras and the times are not synchronized between the cameras. And then when you come to work on all of those images together, and again, I'm thinking of weddings here, if you have a second shooter who has their own camera and then they supply all their images to you and you add all of those images together and then suddenly you find, hang on, my camera was set to, you know, a certain time, but his camera was set a couple of minutes earlier or maybe we just entered daylight saving and his, his camera wasn't set for daylight saving and so all of his Im images are an hour out of sync with my images, you can use the geotagging module to temporarily apply an offset to a group of images so that all of the images actually synchronize within your view. And then you have the export module. And as you would suggest, this is how you export images after you have developed them. Okay, so that's going to do it for now. I've probably covered more than I intended and I probably didn't cover enough for some of you and some of you are already overwhelmed. I really sincerely hope you stick with Darktable. It is an amazing application. Me, when I started with Darktable, okay, so it was 2016, I had a laptop I wasn't using for anything else. I wiped it and put Linux on it because I was new to Linux as well. And, and my whole mindset at the time was if I'm going to jump to Linux, I need to find something that can replace Lightroom. And after a couple of false starts, I found Darktable. And what I almost instantaneously recognized, you know, within a couple of hours of playing with it, was this is really daunting but I recognized straight away that it was amazingly powerful. And I thought, this is going to be worth the time and the brain cycles as an investment, you know, to get up to speed with this. I can tell it's going to be a really, you know, comparable piece of software to Lightroom. And what I came to realize further down the track was it's better than Lightroom. Now, you can call me biased, that's fine, I don't mind. Time will tell whether I'm selling snake oil or whether I'm telling you the truth. I, I genuinely believe in my heart that it is better than Lightroom. I really do feel that. So I hope you stick with it. Uh, by all means, go back and watch some of the older videos. Some of it is no longer relevant, depending on which version of Darktable you're running but a lot of it is still quite relevant. 
Uh, in the next video, we will dive into the darkroom and how you actually process your images. I hope I'll see you then. Until then, take care. I'll catch you in the next one.